Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the India Today Conclave. Uh, we live in a polarized era where nothing seems to divide public opinion or political opinion at times in particular, as much as the state of the economy at the moment. It's been said that there are lies, damn lies, and there are statistics. In these polarized times, therefore, figures on the state of the economy are thrown at us that are designed to often confuse as much as to illuminate. So where does the elusive truth lie on the state of the Indian economy? That's what we want to discuss with two very fine minds. Uh, my first guest is someone who has given, what, nine budgets, speeches, uh, has been one of the most distinguished finance ministers the country had, author of the dream budget of 1997 that brought, importantly, all our tax rates down. Uh, please welcome Mr. P. Chidamram. And uh, with him is uh, Neelkan Mishra. He's chief strategist at Asia at Credit Suez and also a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Uh, so thank you both, uh, Neelkant Mishra and uh, P. Chidambaram, for joining us today. What I'm going to do is going to keep this simple so that I will let you take the floor on each specific issue. I will throw one figure and or I'll throw two figures which perhaps have two varying interpretations and you can tell us what the state of the economy looks like today. Let's start, Mr. Chidambaram, with... GDP. The government says, despite the global slowdown caused by COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war, the Indian economy is expected to grow at 7% plus in fiscal 22-23, the highest rate of growth among all major economies. So that's one number. The other number, which perhaps Neil Khan could respond to, is that the last quarter has seen a slowing down to 4.4%. And the likes of Raghuram Rajan are saying, we are slipping back towards the so-called Hindu rate of growth. And therefore, we have less to celebrate, more to introspect. Two numbers, 7% growth rate 22-23 versus a slowing 4.4% in the last quarter. Mr. Chidambaram, what's the reality? The reality is we are growing, but the quarter upon quarter growth or the sequential quarter growth is declining. 13.2%, 6.3%, 4.4%, and the fourth quarter, my estimate is between 4.1% and 43 So it is a declining quarterly growth rate, which means Indian economy is losing steam. So you're saying the Indian economy is losing steam, but you accept that the Indian economy continues to grow among major economies faster than most other economies in the world. There's no, no boast in saying, I'm the one-eyed monarch of the blind. The point is, China, when it grows at 3% or 3.5%, will still add every year to its annual wealth or annual output several times more than India growing at 7%. China is five and a half times larger than India. Therefore, the relevant number is the per capita income. And the per capita income, we are still a very poor country. Nilkant Mishra, how do you see these numbers when it comes to the GDP numbers that the government throws at us saying, look, we are the fastest growing economy in the world. On the flip side, Mr. Chidambaram could argue saying that we are a slowing economy and there could be those who would argue that even pre-pandemic for nine consecutive quarters, the Indian economy was in decline. So what are we celebrating at the moment? So we have to first understand that no economy is an island. There is a world where uh, there is a significant decline in global growth. Demand for global goods is at March 21 level. So for, for two years, there's been zero growth in demand for retail sales or retail sales of goods. There is significant financial uncertainty. 
there are several economies that have gone into bankruptcy. I think what India should aim for and is aiming for is macroeconomic stability. Because remember that economics is not about scoring a run or a six on every ball. It's about being able to stitch together a long innings and create uh, a much larger uh, uh, wealth and uh, income uh, range for, for, it, for, for its citizens. So, what is extremely important right now is that in this global financial turbulence, if India is seen as a stable economy, it will continue to attract foreign investors, it will continue to attract foreign companies which can bring skills and technology. And so on a five-year basis, I think the expectations of India's GDP growth uh, should be that India will contribute 12 to 15 percent of incremental GDP in the next five years. So I think we have to stop looking at, see, and, and let me tell you that quarterly GDP numbers are, are extremely inaccurate. They keep getting revised up. You must have seen that past data, when they released these data, past data was revised up by 1.3 percent. So the, the level of GDP in FY23 has been raised up by 1.3 percent. So as per the NSO's numbers, fourth quarter GDP growth is going to be 6 percent. Everyone expects FY24 GDP to be 6% plus. I think it should be 7%. So I think we have to be a lot more forward looking. Many other measures, and I'll just take half a minute, many other measures like say the, the sales of the BSE 500 companies, there is absolutely no slowdown in, uh, in output. Taking off from what Mr. Mishra said, he used the word macroeconomic stability in particular. And let me throw another number which is contentious inflation. In India, averaging 5.5% in the last year, much less than most South Asian countries and the Western world. The Modi government says, compared in particular to the UPA years, we have done much better in keeping inflation under control. Inflation during the UPA years was double digit. In the UPA years, between 2000 Nine and 2011, inflation was indeed very high. And the reason is obvious. It was because uh, Mr. Mukherjee, I think, following other finance ministers, believed in stimulus packages. We spent money which we did not have. And therefore, inflation went out of control. So, we don't deny that. No, no, but that's precisely what the Modi government says, Mr. Chidambaram, that during the COVID years, there was pressure on, on, on the Modi government to also give fiscal stimulus yes. packages. The government resisted it, didn't wrong. go the way of other Western economies, the and that's why we are in a better position than many other countries in the world today. The government was wrong. The government was wrong in not doing a fiscal stimulus. That's why... Three crore people had to migrate from other cities and states back to Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. We had uncounted and unaccounted deaths in the pandemic. We had bodies floating down the river Ganga. We had funeral pyres on the banks of rivers. See, Neil Kanth and Mr. Modi are speaking about half of India. For example, the two examples he gave top 500 companies, foreign direct investment. It makes sense only to the first 70 crore of India. It makes no sense at all to the bottom 70 crore of India. And even if 70 crore of India buy and sell and go around, India's economy will look shining. But what about the bottom 70, uh, 70 crore? Therefore, Mr. Modi neglected the bottom 70 crore and I squarely charge this government of having neglected the poor and the very poor. Neelkan Mishra, you want to respond because this was a contentious issue right through the COVID period, whether there should be fiscal, whether the government of the day should go in for a major fiscal stimulus. The government resisted pressures from the likes of Mr. Chidambaram and today turns around to say, look, that's why we, our inflation situation is far better than it is in many Western economies. That explains why we look at the moment from the outside at least as more macroeconomically stable. 
I'll answer that question in two parts. Uh, the first is that, remember that we are, uh, we are chronically dependent on external capital. We have we've always had a current account deficit. We need foreign flow of capital. If we are seen, so if you are, if you are the US where you can print dollars and consume, and of course, as we are realizing that creates its own issues, which they are facing now, but uh, they could get away with it. I don't think uh, the global markets would have kept giving us uh, dollars and that would have created a lot more of instability. Uh, and I don't think that was the, that was the right, that would have been the right thing to do. Uh, but look at what is happening now. See, when you lock people down, uh, what slows down is not as much goods consumption, but services consumption, because contact services get affected. And services consumption is mostly about the rich buying the poor's time. Uh, it's rarely about the poor buying the richest time. And when that stops, so at the end of the lockdowns, the rich were, had a lot of savings, the poor were very badly affected. They had very weak balance sheets. They had to shed assets. But once the economy opened up and the rich started spending, that money has started to flow. Mm -hmm. This is a pattern that is now visible across the global economy. It is visible in India. If you see data, so I'll back it up with data. Uh, our equivalent of unemployment claims is, uh, which, which you see in the US, right, to be really quoted, is Narega demand. Narega demand in February is lower than February 20, pre-pandemic. It is significantly lower than February 19. You look at rural wage growth. Rural wage growth had been stuck in a rut even before 2020. It is now uh, at 6.5%. Uh, for the first time in three years, it is positive the, in real terms. So it is now higher than inflation. So there is a certain process of healing. If you try to uh, over interrupt the process in the economy, then you actually you can actually do some damage. So I think the uh, Mr. Chidambaram is absolutely right that, that during the pandemic, the poor were very, very badly affected. But I think the right and the more sustainable way to get them back uh, to health is to, uh, to let the, the, the savings happen and the economy naturally rebalance itself. You want to respond, Mr. Chidambaram? Yes. He was shaking your head. But please throw a number. This is only about data. Yeah, here is a number. 1.4 crore fewer Indians employed in October 22 than in January 20. Second, Raghuram Rajan, Rohit Lamba, Rahul Chauhan jointly wrote an article, India's humming economy isn't yet helping much of its low-income citizens who need the education deficit bridged and policies that promote job creation. Again, Mr. Mishra talks about only half of India. The other half is what I'm concerned about. He's talking the language that we first made popular in India after 1991. So I'm not denying all that he says, but that makes sense only to the top half of India. Not even the top half, but I'm willing to in, uh, divide India into the bottom half and the top half. If child um, stunting and wasting is between 20 and 30 percent, mm -hmm. if 49 percent of all women are anemic, what does that mean? It means that people do not have enough food. The only reason for child stunting and child wasting and anemic women is because they don't take enough nutritious food. Now, you look at the sh spanking new bridge of flyover and you say, what a remarkable achievement. That is what he's doing. But what about the people who are huddled under the bridge and live there day and night? That is the bottom half. And we and this government is completely callous and neglects the bottom half. I want Mr. Mishra to travel with me. I can take him to a relatively developed state like Tamil Nadu and take him into the interior. And in village after village, you will see that the poor constitute about 15 to 20 to 25 percent of the people. The government will respond, uh, 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 Mr. Chidambaram, to what you've just said by saying, look, during COVID, we provided 80 crore uh, Indians food free of cost 
ration subsidies we provided under the uh, Pradhan Mantri uh, Kisan Samman Yojana quarterly 2,000 rupees to, uh, to, the, to farming communities. We have done whatever we had to in terms of welfare schemes during the COVID pandemic to offset the difficulties faced by those whom you keep saying are at the bottom of the pyramid. Yes, but not enough. That's the point. Uh, every government has to do something. They did, but not enough. My point is, emphasize the not enough, as a result of which there was massive unemployment, massive hunger. Why are we 101 on the hunger index? You can always rubbish that. Why are we 101 on the hunger index out of 120 countries? Neelkan? So, uh, I, I must say that uh, my ancestral village is in uh, Champaran, in East Champaran in Bihar. Uh, it is, on some measures, the third poorest district of Bihar. So, I have seen poverty. I have, I have seen how things have changed. Uh, and now I have, se I have seen how things are changing now. Uh, in the last three years, uh, the, every house in the village has electricity. Uh, when we did up for the first time fans in our rural house, I was surprised that there was an electrician in the village. Uh, there is. Are you saying all of this happened post 2014? Mm -hmm. Are you saying electrification came post 2014? Seriously, Nilkan Mishra? Actually, India available? became independent in 2014. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not saying that. No, no. See, um, my okay. I am a. I am an economist. I look at data. Sure. I, uh, when it happened, what happened? I. I. I am perhaps less uh, qualified to say. What I can say is that uh, when I now travel to my village, there is a lot less of poverty that I see, uh, and I can see piped water. I can see people in pakka houses. It's very hard to see mud huts and and thatch roofs. Uh, I can see people commuting to nearby cities. So I think the, the change, if we think about it, has to be more in terms of providing infrastructure, providing uh, uh, access to internet, providing uh, access to opportunities. And look, uh, if you divide growth into three parts, and I'll take, take one minute on this, uh, you, can, you can grow output by adding labor, you can grow output by adding capital, or you can grow output by improving productivity. Now, in labor input, I don't think there is much more that we can do. What we need to do, if we have to really grow GDP and grow output and really match what China did, China grew so much faster than us from 1980 to uh, maybe uh, well, till, till very recently. Uh, it was because it attracted mass and created massive amounts of capital. And that is the only way to pull hundreds or tens of millions of people out of poverty. And I think uh, uh, driving productivity growth requires that uh, individuals have, have, there are rural roads connecting to, uh, you know, every village. People uh, have access to uh, cheap data uh, so that they can access jobs. There is less friction in the job market. I think all of those ch things are changing. L let's look at infrastructure in two uh, parts. You, wait, you, wait. Want, you want to throw a number yeah. again? No, no, I'm not throwing a number. You caution me that this is about numbers, and he's quoting numbers. Here is an official number. Three out of four rural homes without piped drinking water. This is the NSSO, National Statistics Office. Second, survey debunks Swachh Bharat's 100% ODF claim. Over 21% of rural households do not have access to any type of toilet, according to a government survey. Which also means, sir, pre-2014, much of which was ruled by your party, most Indians did not have access also to pipe water. So just as they can't argue Nobody that India denies. changed post-2014, they could turn around and say, look, much didn't happen pre-2014. Nobody denies that. Nobody denies that roads are built every year, sure. our homes are built every year, Rome is not built in a day. Sure. The point is, all the things that were done and all the things that were being done are being improved upon. But don't make a claim that India is ODF. Don't make a claim as he just made. Every house has got a pipe drinking water. Don't make these claims. The numbers who are denied basic facilities are staggering. They are large enough to constitute many countries. 
If once you recognize this hard truth that there is a 20% or 25% or 30% or 35% that is very poor, no electricity, no toilet, no access to cooking fuel, once you recognize that, I'm not complaining about the government's efforts to improve things. But don't say everything is done. I, let me try and extract a concession out of each of you. From you, Mr. Chidambaram, do you concede that in the last eight years, in terms of physical infrastructure, in pure terms of capex outlay on physical infrastructure, in terms of actual project execution, especially roads, and I can throw the figures, capex outlay in the budget 23-24 height by 33% to 10 lakh crores, would you concede that that is an area where the Modi government has done well above average? See, five years from today, the capital expenditure will be 20 lakh crore. But in terms of the road, uh, road outlay Just per day that has been added in the last eight years. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying that. This was started by Vajpayee, the Golden Quadrilateral, and the NHAI was started by us. And the NHAI has started building roads. And as every year passes, the capacity and the pace of building roads will increase. Five years later, whoever is the government, it will increase again. Ten years later, it will increase again. Therefore, the point is, I'm not denying that there is growth, there is building infrastructure. But all I'm pointing out is the massive numbers that are left behind. And who is talking about it? And, and on the other side, the possible concession that someone who's close to the Prime Minister's economic or is part of the Prime Minister's economic advisory council, the investments made by this government in education, for example. The education ministry's budget allocation increased by a marginal 8.2% from 1.2 lakh crores as opposed to 1.4 lakh crores in 22-23. This government has simply not invested enough in education, which is critical. You gave the China example. China is not just about its physical infrastructure. It's also about the soft infrastructure that China built especially in education. This government is not seen to have done enough. Do you concede that? See, the, if, if you see the, the growth in infrastructure also, it is mostly in sectors controlled by the center. So it is in national highways, it is in railways, it is in airports, uh, it is in uh, the, the major ports. It is very difficult to micromanage. And so, so one area where I think we need to do a lot of investments and we're not doing enough is urban infrastructure. But that's something that the center uh, struggles to do. And I must say that while there is, I think, sufficient acknowledgement that there is a lot more that needs to be done on health and education. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the adults who will be driving our economy in 2047 are, I mean, need to get good nutrition today and good education today. And I think that needs urgent attention. But there is very limited ability for the center to do it. But I'm, I'm quite encouraged that some of the states are starting to take very positive steps on that. Let's look at another critical area, MSMEs, uh, which are critical to future growth. A recent survey by Consortium of Indian Asso Associations, Nilkan Mishra states, 72% of MSMEs have remained stagnant since the past five years. 76% of MSMEs were not making a profit. Access to bank finance remains a major issue. Do you believe that MSMEs is another area where the Modi government has promised more than it's delivered? Yes? Um See, MSME funding, if you, if you go back even 70, 80 years, uh, this, is a, this is a classic problem of, uh, uh, of the financial system and the way it is architected. And this has been there for in the US, in UK, even today they struggle with it. The whole starting point of the, of the venture capital industry in the US was this small business uh, innovation program where uh, the government realized that uh, banks were un unable to give loans to small companies. So it's a continuing challenge. Uh, I think the best way to support MSMEs uh, is to improve formalization, to improve penetration of data. If you look at schemes like the account aggregator scheme, uh, the fact that there is so much data now coming in through GST, through, uh, through UPI, through uh, uh, Fastag, and lots of other, or like the eBay bills, 
there are innovative schemes that can be created, but these things take, uh, you know, so that whole infrastructure takes time to build. Um, the quantum or rather the size of loans that can be given profitably um, has definitely gone down, right? So earlier, if you, if you talked about a loan ticket size of 5 or 10 lakhs or below, it was very difficult to give those loans. But I think now we are seeing 50,000, 30,000 rupee loan ticket sizes being given. So I think there is visible improvement. For MSMEs to do well, we need the broader economy to do well. And I think that healing process is only just now taking off. So I think we should see improvement in the next year. So. Because Nilkant Mishra briefly referred to GST. These are the numbers, Mr. Chidambaram. Monthly GST revenues now more than 1.4 lakh crores for 12 straight months in a row. So something obviously is happening on the ground that suggests that manufacturing is picking up, that the economy is picking up. No, no, GST is both on goods and services. That's right. Therefore, the point is GST collections are getting better because the hardware, the backbone is getting better and uh, leakages are being plugged more efficiently. But then the credit must go equally to the center and to the states because 50 percent of the GST uh, payers are under the jurisdiction of the states and only 50 percent are under the jurisdiction of the center. The center uh, assumes that the states have no role. GST collections will improve. It's like saying um, I'm, 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 I'm wiser this year because I'm older. You will be wiser next year, you will be older again. Every year, things will be added, but that is no credit. The question is, how many people are you leaving behind? Now, Mishra said about higher education. Now, 18,956 posts, that is 33% of all teaching posts are vacant in central universities. 33% of all teaching posts are vacant in central universities. In IITs, out of 8,153 sanctioned posts, 3,253 are vacant. Now, why is the central government not filling IITs and central universities directly under the control of the central government? You have something like 33 to 40 percent of teaching posts vacant. Well, what is the answer of the education minister? Let me turn to another area, Mr. Chidambaram, because there was a speech that you delivered in Parliament that's gone viral since. Because in that speech, you had questioned the whole digital payment focus of the government of India, where you had suggested in a way that will someone who lives in a small village be able to understand how the UPI interface will work? Will there be the necessary network there? Now, the truth is, 40% of the entire world's digital payments took place last year in just India. In FY21, India processed 22.28 billion transactions, amounting to rupees 41.03 trillion. And India's digital payments market is expected to more than triple from $3 trillion to $10 trillion by 2026. So you seem to be very skeptical of the digital revolution that the Modi government spoke about. The fact is the digital revolution is here. Read the vegetable speech. vendor is using UPI. Read that speech again. They started by saying, after demonetization, we'll have a cashless economy. That was a central issue. Then they modified it to say, not cashless, less cash economy. I pointed out, that however digitalization takes place, whatever pace, there will be more cash in circulation. I've been proved right. Today, there are 33 lakh crore cash in circulation, more than twice it was on the day before demonetization. Digitization will take place. At the same time, cash will also grow. 80% of Germany's payments are cash. But that doesn't mean Germany does not believe in digitization or Germany does not use digitization. Both ha are necessary. Digitization will take place. It will gather pace, but more and more cash will also be necessary and will be used. Are you going to give the Modi government any credit though for the acceleration of the pace of digitization? Undenying, they built on our Aadhaar, so they should thank us. 
they built on they built on our radar they built on which our, you didn't take enough credit for please understand we started aadhar only in 2012 13 we were in office only for a year dr rangarajan when he was governor started the no frills account or zero balance account which is now called jandan account so both initiatives were taken up by the upa and i am willing to share credit with the nda government that aadhar and and the uh, the janda are our joint uh, effort okay that's good to hear i mean you know i am glad to hear that sometimes governance and governments can be seen as a continuum but in conclusion if there was one aspect nilkan mishra of the government's management of the economy over the last 9 years that you believe leaves a lot to be desired if you would like to see one major change in the direction that the modi government has taken this economy in the last 9 years what would that be nilkan what would you like to see happen that hasn't happened that you believe can be truly transformative if we look forward to the next decade no i think uh, uh, to continue with where i left off on that split between labor capital and tfp uh, we if we need to accelerate growth see we have about 30 years by 2053 our average age will be above 40 we do not want to grow old before we grow rich and we need we cannot be satisfied with 7% growth we have to aspire for 8 9% growth to grow faster we need a lot more of foreign capital we need a lot more of foreign uh, skills and technology and to do that we need to ease the the bottlenecks that foreign firms face when they come to india uh, for example in say signing uh, 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 you know advanced pricing agreements like you know if if there's a subsidiary of a foreign company which is setting up here it'll always be vulnerable to to harassment by tax authorities uh, and therefore just have i providing some some uh, certainty and streamlining their process vietnam does it in 4 weeks it takes us 6 months i think those are things that if we speed up i think we can we can sustainably accelerate india's growth you know mr chidambaram in conclusion the other day uh, uh, deepak bagla who mm -hmm. heads invest india uh, in the government of india uh, delivered a speech where he threw up figures about foreign direct investment coming into india over the last few years and some of those figures clearly showed a quantum jump in foreign direct investment so in conclusion i'm i'm only throwing that as one number but in conclusion would you if you, there was one thing that you would give this government credit for in the last 8 years because surely over 8 9 years governments do things that are to be seen as positive what would the big plus point for you be in the modi government's handling of the economy after the bitter experience of 2009 to 11 and when i came back to the finance ministry the lesson i learned and tried to inculcate uh, through government was we must manage our debt we must manage our borrowing because that's the single most important factor which affects uh, credit which affects inflation which affects our ability to spend and i would give credit to this government for its single minded focus on containing the deficit and the debt management it's taken me 35 minutes to get you to give the government some credit but you know that's not a that, that's a but good you, sign but you don't ask me for that number you were throwing up numbers which are uh, uh, these uh, uh, india shining numbers <laughs> you were throwing numbers and i have given you numbers and i didn't hear nilkanth deny any of these numbers vacancies in iit vacancies in uh, central universities 21% uh, no access to toilets um, uh, to total number of employment has fallen down by 1.2 crore none of those numbers were refuted these are all official numbers and therefore all i'm saying is this is our government whether we voted or not it's our government we have to take credit for whatever the government is doing and i have no hesitation in 
giving credit to where it is due. But all I'm pointing out is there is so much more to be done, so much more to be done, and a prime minister with so much energy and drive and control over his party and government can do so much more. Instead of that, uh, we're talking about um, non-interview and a documentary. Why are we wasting time on those things? Well, you in parliament, you're a member of parliament, you should perhaps on Monday morning go to parliament and say, let's have a debate on health and education That's what and investments and abs teacher absentism yes. in central universities. I Instead of I'll say that at instead 11 of talking about what Mr. Modi said or what Mr. Rahul Gandhi Correct. said, maybe let's talk on hard numbers. I'm in willing to say well. that at 11 o'clock, but before I complete my sentence, the house will be adjourned. Okay, <laughs> given given the, that unfortunate reality, perhaps the conclave is the only place where we can get uh, a relatively non-noisy, certainly non-noisy, and at some level even a bipartisan debate on the state of our economy, which is why it's precious to have these spaces. Nilkant Mishra, P. Chidambaram, thank you so much for joining me here on the India Today Conference. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, raise a round of applause for Mr. Chidambaram and uh, Mr. Mishra. I request both the gentlemen to stay on stage as I quickly call upon Ashok Kumar, Chief Engineer, Life Insurance Corporation of India, to come up on stage and present a small token of our appreciation to our esteemed panelists. And Rajdeep, you might have said uh, relatively less noisy a little too early because our next session is Supriya Shrinet and Amit Malvia together on the stage. So, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, raise a round, uh, a warm round of applause. For the gentlemen, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let me take you now to our next session. Uh, it's a session you've seen go down quite a few many times on television, hopefully this time it's going to be different and as uh, Rajdi pointed out, less noisier for sure. Next session, debating political campaigns and social media narratives. Let me call upon session's moderator, news director, Ajta India Today, executive director, business today, Rahul Kabal. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard the Chief Justice of India. Now get ready for Diwali to come early to the India Today conclave. Can I call upon our speakers, please? Uh, Mr. Amit Malviya Suprashanit, can you join me? In 2014 and in 2019, the BJP had a massive lead over the Congress when it came to shaping the narrative via social media. Will the 2024 elections see a more level playing field between the government and the opposition? Or will the narrative once again be dominated by the BJP's giant social media army? I want to begin this session by showing you where things stand on social media at this moment. What we've done is we've compared the social media reach of the BJP and the Congress on different uh, social media platform and that will be up on your screen to give you a sense of where things stand. So this is BJP versus Congress on Twitter, 20 million followers for the BJP, 9.3 million followers when we last checked for the Congress. The BJP has an average of 371 retweets per tweet, average likes is 1000, the Congress has 514 retweets, average and average likes is one and a half thousand. Let's now come to BJP versus Congress on Facebook. There again, the BJP ahead of the Congress by quite a fair distance. Um, 16 million followers for the BJP on Facebook, 6.4 million for the Congress, 194 average shares for the BJP, 167 for the Congress. So the Congress's game on Twitter stronger than the game of on uh, Facebook, but the BJP once again more than double the strength when it comes to follow account on Facebook. 
let's now compare the two primary leaders of these two parties, Prime Minister Modi and Member of Parliament Rahul Gandhi. The Prime Minister has 87.1 million followers on Twitter. Rahul Gandhi now has 22.9. Rahul Gandhi, though, gets more average likes per tweet. That's 34.3 thousand, 34,300 odd likes, 9.2 average retweets. Uh, the Prime Minister gets about 4,000 average retweets. Let's now compare Mr. Modi and Rahul Gandhi on Facebook. 48 million followers for the Prime Minister on Facebook. Rahul Gandhi very marginal in comparison on Facebook with just 6.4 million. Um, 9.7 thousand likes uh, for the Prime Minister on Facebook versus 2.1 for uh, Mr. Gandhi. That now brings me to our two speakers who are in the battlefield at the conclave. Amit Malviya and Suprashin Net. Amit Malviya at about 700,000 followers on Twitter. Following close behind is Suprashin Net at 577.2. Mr. Malviya has 1.7 thousand uh, average likes, 512 average retweets. Suprashin Net just marginally ahead when it comes to average retweets, 869. Average likes is 3.7. With that, ladies and gentlemen at the India Today Conclave, can we have a warm round of applause as I welcome and introduce Amit Malviya. He heads the social media, the giant social media army of the Bharatiya Janata Party and trying to take him on is Supriya Shrinit. She's been a journalist, now heads uh, the social media division of the Congress Party. Welcome, Mr. Malviya and Supriya Shrinit, and thank you so much for agreeing to join us here. I want to start by asking Amit Malviya about your sense of the comparative landscape on social media building up to the 2024 elections. In the last two elections, the BJP was heads and shoulders ahead of everyone else in the opposition. Do you think that the Congress party has been able to close the gap? In some metrics, they're actually ahead, even if the total follower count is much lesser than the BJP. Will the next election see a more level playing field on social media? Are you confident that you'll win on the ground and on social media in the same thumping fashion that you did last time. Mr. Malviya. Thank you, Rahul. I think you've answered your question by putting out the statistics that you have just mentioned here. Well, beyond these numbers, the social media game is far more deeper and far more pervasive. And I think the BJP is far, far ahead of the Congress. The Congress can probably never even imagine to get to where we are. And it has much to do with Prime Minister Modi's leadership and the organizational footprint of the BJP. Let me explain both of those aspects, and I'll take a couple of minutes to set the agenda for this conversation. Any political party is characterized by its leadership, his vision, the ideology of the party, and the organization's strength. Today, clearly, when it comes to Mr. Modi, he stands heads and shoulders above any other political leader in the country. He is not just someone who is the tallest leader in India, but has a global standing. He's somebody the world now looks up to, and that makes a huge impact. Much as we would like to believe that some of these narratives are very Delhi-centric or urban-centric, the truth of the matter is that with the advent of social media, there has been democratization of discourse, and everything that is said in Delhi reaches the farthest corner of this country. And it is not media that takes the message across, it is the social media that takes the message across. For me, as in charge of the BJP's Information Technology Department, I'm not as much concern about the conversations that go on in Delhi as I am about conversation in Bharuj, in back and beyond of Uttar Pradesh, in Far East, Northeast, in southern parts of the country, the smaller towns, and what are people thinking and consuming there. That's the first part of it. The second part of it, and I think that's where we just win the debate completely, is when you look at what governance actually means, what it means for the people of this country. And I will just put out some statistics to compare 
where we are today in 2022 as compared to where we were in 2014. Sure. She's trolling you already. No, no, I'm just saying 23, we are 23. But the comparative data that I will give out is as of 2022. So it is a comparison between 2014 and 22. The size of the economy, we were 10th in 2014. We are number five today. Share of global GDP, 2.6%. We are 3.4% today. Share in global trade and services, 2.0% in 2014. We are at 22 now. Share in global FDI flows, 2.1% in 2014, 6.7% now. Auto production at number seven in 2014. We are at number three in 2022. Seal production at four in 2014, number two in 2022. Mobile phone manufacturing, number 12. We are today at number two. Number of unicorns, we had four in 2014. We had 116 today in 2022. India's weight in bricks, 14% today, it is at 29%. India's weight in emerging market was 7% in 2014. It's 15% now. Climate change performance, 31 in 2014, number 10 today, Global Innovation Index 83 in 2014, we are up to 46, WGI Governance Index 103 in 2014, 49 now, ease of doing business 142 in 2000, no, I'm not done, I'm not done, I'm not done, you need to give me a couple of more minutes. We were importing locomotives and uh, today we are building trains, the inflation in India is lower than the United States for the last 16 months, I'm not done yet. The focus on infrastructure has been massive. We have invested in the last nine years what we have invested in the previous 67 years, whether it is uh, investment in coal, whether it is investment in ports, railway electrification, highways, urban airports, metros, ports, small, big, everywhere. Okay. No, I'm not done yet. This is the narrative that we are talking about. We talk about PLI scheme, we've invested $2.4 billion, employment, direct employment generation of 40 lakh. Like fighting the election just no, now? No, we are not. But I'm not done yet. That is the point that I'm trying to make. The narrative is about the work that this government has done and Prime Minister Modi has done. And I can go on for the next 30 minutes, which is the time for your schedule. But the thing is, this is how elections are won. So when we talk about social media, we talk about narratives, we talk about governance, we talk about achievements, we talk about development. And clearly, the Congress is no match when it comes to any of these aspects. Mere paas Modi hai. Calm, bolta hai. That's Amit Malviya's response. The Congress may have gained some strength on social media, but he very dismissively says the BJP will shape the narrative because they've got the Prime Minister and their work speaks for itself. Supriya Shrinit, let's have your opening comments. Four and a half minutes of numbers that we heard. Four and a half minutes, with all due respect to my friend right here, of someone who's reading the data very deceptively. Because I will just point out something that he perhaps very grossly missed. You look at the average likes and retweets of Rahul Gandhi and Narendra Modi. You look at the average likes and retweets of the Congress party and the BJP. You look at the average likes and retweets of Supriya Srinath and Amit Malviya, we tower much ahead. So, I mean, as somebody who once again, no, you were listening in rapt attention, listen to me also in rapt attention. This isn't a TV show, right? You said this isn't a show. We are, we are here in the conclave. You listen with such rapt attention, offer me the same courtesy. Four and a half minutes. So my question is, are you looking at engagement? Are you looking at the likes? Are you looking at retweets? Or are you just going to look at that big number? Because that big number is misleading. I am putting out a retweet. And if 10 people are liking it and four are liking his, with many more followers, and by his I mean the BJP and Congress, what does it tell you? That there are more people engaging with us. Forget about social media statistics. Let's talk about the situation on the ground. What is the situation on the ground? And I would like to address the elephant in the room because that is often not addressed. And the elephant in the room is, why do you then have this urgent desire, this unsubstantiated need to weaponize fake news, to weaponize misinformation? And with all due respect to you, my friend, right here, you have the distinguished mark of being flagged off repeatedly for putting fake news from your own platform and your parties through social media and digital platforms. 
what is the need to do so? I would ask a question. I would ask a question when Bharat Jodo Yatra was happening. Every day the BJP's official handle would put out some kind of fake news. We would bust it. Fact checkers would check it. Mr. Malviya himself has the distinguished of being flagged by Twitter. The first person in this country flagged by Twitter for putting out misleading information. So did Donald was Trump. The, and he was the president of America. The, I did not so see that's a great TV. company to be TV. in. This isn't a TV show. I hope you will offer me the courtesy. You did interject me once. I have done my bit Thank as well. Thank you. Thanks. I was reminding you. So I was with Donald Trump, Trump, the president of America. So, where, so, where does the Congress party and Rahul So the reality is, one second Rahul. So the reality is that he's admitting that he put out fake news, he weaponizes misinformation. Well, Thank you, you did my job. I didn't have to do it. It's to say, Thank you very much. It's Thank to you. say that Twitter, not before their you, management do got changed, were doing the bidding of a certain is set this of how people we're with do a different about persuasion. A level field. You start right here. If, I'm just asking you. I mean, do you want to leave the Okay, one, one second. Can we just do this one at a time? You spoke for about four minutes. Yeah, she interjected Allow her to speak. You, she interjected you once. once pointed out you, the year. You've done your you bit. Now please be quiet because once. you will have another chance to speak. You don't want me to do this to you. This is a conclave. I'm, I'm like, done with what I have to say. Like I've made my point. The message has gone loud and across. You can just sit there. I actually got the applause. Popcorn lao, chai lao, pakore lao, kuch coffee wafi pilao. Mr. Malvia here heads the biggest fake news factory on this planet. Planet. He has the distinguished to do that and he is doing that and it's not just him. I hate to say this. I respect anybody in government. I respect institutions. But this is no more about a troll, about a surrogate, about shadow networks. This is about a troll government. I mean, why are ministers in this government reducing themselves to mere trolls? You look at what law minister is saying against, you have an issue with the Congress, we understand we're the main opposition, you will attack us. He has an issue with me, I understand, you know, we do similar things, we are the opposition, we have diverse, uh, you know, divergent ideologies, we will be attacked. Mr. Modi wants to attack Rahul Gandhi, go, by all means. Now you want to attack activists, you want Mr. to attack Modi Supreme Court judges. Now you Rahul Gandhi Supreme Gandhi Supreme Gandhi. Court judges, why, my only question is, in, if you have so much to Tom Tom home about, why reduce yourself okay. to petty sure. two rupee trolls? And I also want to say one thing, and you can then take the mic away from me. Mr. Nishikant Dubey is a BJP MP. He is known to spread fake news in your August company. He has this morning put out a tweet, and I want to put it before the audience right here and let them decide. As a woman, I feel very offended. She's not from my party. She's a TMC MP, an MLA from my party, Deepika Pandey. He puts out a tweet and says, Hamne to Vaishali ki nagar vadhuon ka bhi samman kiya. Vaishali ki nagar vadhu is referring to a prostitute. Are you willing to tell your colleague to take down that tweet? If you are, let's have a discussion. If not, forget about okay. this. Okay, Amit Malviya, the charge against you is that you run the world's largest fake news factory, you called it. Yes. A giant army of trolls that you're constantly being called out for putting out fake news. And let, no, 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 I'll take the mic away otherwise, okay. Now, let, let, Four and a half minutes, you didn't take No, but let off. him speak. You sure. both spoken. Now, respond to the very serious charges that have been leveled by your opponent. Mr. Malbir. You should have worn your bullyproof jacket. Okay. How do you know there's not a hidden bulletproof jacket here? You will need it. He didn't say bullet, he said bully. Oh, bully. Yeah, the bully is closer to you. Um, you should be scared on my left than he on the right. I'm not scared of anybody, least of you. Uh, let me come to the most substantive argument again, because of my, the no, uh, super, my this is not colleague good. from the Congress uh, actually reduced herself to being a troll. All she did was speak about people. I'm not here to speak about people. I'm here to speak about ideas. I'm here to speak about a more progressive regime that we want to see. I'm here to t talk about a more progressive conversation environment. He said this, she said this, usne ye tweet kiya, aap ye karoge, ye troll, wo troll. The fact is, and I want to do some fact checks here. Rahul Gandhi is never mentioned by the Prime Minister, something that she alluded to. I want to get her out of this delusion. The Prime Minister has never mentioned Rahul Gandhi, ever. As far as you're concerned, I don't remember I ever responded to any tweet of yours while you keep co-tweeting me and responding to my tweets, but I'll let it be. It's your prerogative. You are the challenger in this particular case, so you have to be sniping at us all the time. You're free to do it. But that's not really either my style of doing things or my parties. So I will move on from here, Rahul. You spoke about the presence of social media and what it has really done to the discourse. 
I spoke about democratization of discourse, and I think that's a very, very powerful idea, and most people do not quite understand the impact that it has made. Before 2014, it was widely believed that few editors sitting here in Delhi decided what the discourse on a particular issue should be. There were contentious issues on which the narrative was decided by the establishment, and the media, which was willing to play ball with the establishment, took that idea further. With the advent of social media, a lot of that has changed and changed significantly. Because today people have an opinion. For example, she lamented about some of the observations that the law minister made. Is it her argument that the law minister should not have an opinion on how India's judiciary should be like? Or should a lawyer or a legal professional not have an opinion on the judicial system of the country? Today, social media allows that to be done, and no voice is dependent on a mainstream media to publish them because they can either put it on their blog or there are several prolif proliferating uh, so digital She's also platforms saying, Mr. and Malviya, they can cover them. Her argument is that whatever her message is at this moment is getting greater response average likes, average retweets, engagement, that they are doing much better than in the past. In fact, they're beating you on many metrics. Well, if that was indeed the case, they would not have folded up in the recently concluded elections in Northeast. The best that they won in a state was about five seats. That's all that they got. So I don't know where is it resonating with who is it that's resonating. That's a very good counter. No, Supriya that's Aap social media pe jito, Amit Mali hey, and the BJP minute. will win hey, elections. No, no, no. The, the point that I'm making is social media pe bhi nahi jeet rahe hain. Today, the BJP's strength comes from the huge volunteer army and people who have an opinion, who we engage with. They are our strength. They take the idea forward. They take the ideological arguments further. In the Congress's scheme of things, okay. they have a battery of official accounts and a few leaders who are active. That doesn't make social media. For me, okay. a person, no, let me finish. For me, so the, the person in Kishan Ganj, characters. in That's Katihar, in Erode, in Far East, uh, Far North even East, if, is important. Even if you claim to be getting more likes and retweets, it doesn't matter very much because his party is winning all the elections. I'm not going there. I'm going to first address the You elephant. can't go there because century. you're not winning there. So you want to avoid that conversation. Okay. Mr. Malvia, let us speak. Some of you can clap, but just wait for my turn. Maybe she wants to abandon the conversation. So, we you know, let her I have a, it I must have be embarrassing for her to be here. Okay, let us speak. Let us speak. Don't troll me here because you know what I'll do to you. I next. don't need to. I have 24 papers right here in front of me. I don't want to get personal. I will just quote two or three papers out of you them. You can't go beyond that. I will You've tell been you doing why. Let us you speak. started with that. That was your first argument. That Sir, was your last speak. argument. Because you cannot compete You just made such a long, comprehensive argument. Allow the lady an opportunity to respond. That is why you want to go down that path. I said this. I have page on the 24th page. You flag off. Kar diya. Are bhaiya, I've been around for nine years. If you play a test match, you'll have a few white balls. Okay, now let us speak. 24 pages right here. This gentleman sitting on my left called out for fake news all the time. And there's a reason why I want to talk about fake news and weaponizing misinformation. Last week, about seven days back, they almost got Tamil Nadu and Bihar at blows. You know why? Because Manish Kashyap, a fake YouTuber, made a fake video which was being propagated by the entire BJP IT cell, including their leaders, and they if, almost came to blows. Don't speak in between if now. If nothing was Mr. happening Mania, in Tamil Nadu, Mr. why did the Chief Minister issue statements no, is, in I'm Hindi? sorry, you have to play the anchor here, right? I'm, I'm a little pissed off I, with you right now. This why is not you're on. not able to bully? This is not on. I mean, let's, let's be... What did I do wrong? I'm trying to get out. Ruko to say. Beach mein bolo to say. Main bol bol le bhi to do. Haan, bolo. So far, I kya bol la hai? Aap bol rahe hain. Mr. Mali, let us speak. With Do the fake news give her a video, chance. I mean, they were putting we... out misinformation that Biharis were being subjected to harassment, which was wrong. It was a video shot in Bihar by actors through a production house, and that video was being circulated by them. I'm just giving you examples. Bharat Jodo Yatra. We were in Madhya Pradesh, Mahakaleshwar. Rahul Gandhi ji does an aarti. I'm just telling you the, the kind of fake news propaganda that comes from no less than the IT cell head. 
which was shared by of course many people rahul gandhi ji did an aarti and aarti is done in a clockwise direction everybody and their mothers who do aarti know that mr marvia tweets rahul gandhi doesn't know how but to do the aarti but it speaks volumes about I rahul think, gandhi's credibility because i think the As problem somebody is who hops that mr marvia missed the physics class in school in physics in class 7th i was taught lateral inversion but i knew that would be lost on him so what i did instead was i put out an aarti of modi ji because on camera wo dono ulti dikhti hai jab wo dekha to bechare chup ho gaye fir inhone kya bola aage suniye fir inhone bola there were there were multiple things that he lied about one of the things that they lied about was jitendra singh who was india's former minister of state for home affairs was tying rahul gandhi ji's shoes now that was fact checked twitter flagged it as fake news misleading information why does he not why does he have to do this why do you this urgent this? need to put out fake news all the why time why do you put out why fake news why did smriti irani for instance i'm asking you why did smriti irani for instance have to go to tamil nadu and say rahul gandhi never visited the vivekanand statue he did he even did a parikrama around it what is this okay, complete no, desire to why ऐसे प्यार से मुझे भी बोला करो लेट स्पीक नहीं अभी रुकिए आप व्हाट इज दिस डिजायर टू लाइ व्हाट इज दिस डिजायर टू लाइ व्हाट इज दिस डिजायर टू मिसलीड व्हाट इज दिस डिजायर टू स्प्रेड फेक न्यूज इफ यू हैव अ नैरेटिव पेटल दैट योर नैरेटिव इज फेक न्यूज ओके रिस्पॉन्ड टू द चार्ज रिकॉग्नाइजेस दैट ओके इंक्लूडिंग द अप्लॉज दैट आई एम गेटिंग वी आर लेफ्ट टू द कांग्रेस पार्टी and maybe i should no, not no, start no, interjecting no, 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 no. i said unko bhi bolna chahiye no, 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 let him speak no, 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 come on no, no, i'm just saying let us let him speak now please. let to the congress no no please friend. let him speak Why Give he said the same thing to me let him speak no no i mean you can take 5 minutes and i know my love one second one second let him speak i'll be the adult in the room that's okay let him speak do it well left to the congress party they come out will you get nishikant dubey to deny one second supriya this is not right will he get no one second you spoke and you level so many charges please. now allow him the courtesy of responding please he was please. speaking continuously while i was talking he wasn't he wasn't he, he wasn't? was largely was he, or was he not no no no, no, no. this is just playing to the gallery about? no you are just no, playing no. to the gallery allow him to speak please. you just said you want to be adult in the room and you suddenly change your mind <laughs> i've always been well, curious where do you get the accent from let me finish just curious to us let me finish the fact is left to the congress party they would disown their own leader's speech rahul gandhi goes to london and he addresses this journalist conference and he seeks foreign intervention europe and america the lady sitting here who just claimed to be an adult goes out and does a press conference miss quotes another speech of rahul gandhi to say that rahul gandhi never asked for foreign intervention if the congress spokes people are going to be babysitting rahul gandhi they can't blame us for pointing out the obvious you have a bunch of psychophants in your party so psychophancy is something associated with your party so if something gets called out why should you take offense to it number 1 number 2 if the congress party cannot make up its mind whether rahul gandhi is unfortunately an mp or unfortunately an mp for you as he was further tutored and it goes on social media they can't blame the bjp you have a leader who can't string a single sentence on his own you have a leader who can't make up his mind ki sawal ke jawab hone chahiye ya jawab ke sawal hone chahiye ab ye social media mein to jayega hi na he can't pronounce vishweshwaraiya we are just facing karnataka election i mean if that is the caliber of your leader and that is the man that you are defending we are well within our right to highlight all that he does and if that okay, let her respond now you can be upset for it for okay. all i care look you are invested in rahul gandhi i understand but we are doing the job of taking him to the world you should thank us for it that he's the reality is canon he's he, he just gives a lot of fodder by constantly making mistakes and tying himself up in knots and therefore mr malvia gets ammunition to use against you let's I mean, we listen will, to speech far just, more than probably the congress does i will just uh, point out three instances and let the audience decide for themselves we are a country of 1.4 billion 140 crore ka desh hai 
140 crore people, the Prime Minister finds 600 crore voters here. And no less than World Economic Forum Davos, he told the audience, there are 600 crore voters in this country through a prepared speech. He really brought us global glory. Uh, the entire right wing, including large sections of the media, were, quoted, uh, were quoting the deputy leader of the Nobel Committee. Mr. Modi is the front runner. The Nobel Committee deputy leader had to put out a statement saying this is fake news. This is a fake tweet. Do not give it energy and oxygen because I have said nothing remotely which matches that. Such global glory. Vivekanand, Guru Nanak or Kabir, who were born in the the India's Prime Minister says this. So I'm just asking you questions. This is India's Prime Minister tutored. He has prepared text. He has assistance. He has all of that. I will. And because the speech has been talked about and because we're not addressing Adani yet, which I will next, Mr. Rahul Gandhi said this. And he said this at the IJA that he refers to. How can anybody find fault? I am, I am quoting him verbatim. Indian democracy is a public good. In Hindi, Bharat ka loktantra vishwa ke liye saugat hai. Indian democracy is a public good. 140 crore people live in this democracy. The state of our democracy is going to decide the state of democracies on this planet. This is putting Indian democracy at the okay. center stage. So, one second. No, Rahul, I'm not done. Please hold on. Rahul. Ra no, no, Rahul. Would you play that three this, minutes left? Is there a, is there a, I'm asking you. And then he was asked a question would you play exactly that on it. That you're adding words. You are, you're you're no, adding to Rahul second. Gandhi's mouth. One second. Things I you got three minutes left. I, I mean, we don't have to add no, anything no, to Rahul Gandhi. We know Rahul Gandhi. For God's sake, he's uh, Congress this is our problem. gift to the this world. This is our internal problem. This is an Indian problem and India will find a solution to no. this. Do you, you not understand that? Do you not understand English? If you, the reality is you, you want to run away from Adani. You don't want to discuss you Adani in Parliament. And so you mute Parliament. Did you do a show yesterday of how the Lok Sabha was muted for 16 minutes? Can you imagine? It is not just mics that are being turned off. Lok Sabha that was being telecasted through the Sunset TV was muted because they wanted to drown the audio where people started saying okay. Rahul Gandhi. You've got two minutes left. How could I have done a show yesterday? How could I have done a show yesterday? I was here at the conclave you, the do whole day. Do a show day. tomorrow. Do a show, show day after. And call me shows. for that show and I will show okay. you evidence. Let 16 respond. minutes, India's parliament That you are running away from the question of Adani. Why are you going well, away? Let Mr. Because you respond. cannot okay. spell Supriya, A of spoken. Adani. That's as simple as that. Adani ko bachana hai, sare mantri mandal ka yahi bahana hai. Aur kuch nahi hai. If you doubt the collective intelligence of the audience in this room and pretend that Rahul Gandhi did not seek foreign intervention in India's internal affairs, our this, problem, hypocrisy, is problem, speak now. Indian problem, Supriya. hypocrisy Supriya. is what is sinking the Congress Party. It's treacherous. You've it's treacherous this the hypocrisy is what is sinking complete. the Congress Party. Secondly, I will not let him go away. The only time the Parliament cameras and telecasts were switched off and the Congress surreptitiously passed the Andhra Pradesh Lok bifurcation TV bill. Was muted for 16 minutes. That was when the UPA was in power. Can you answer this audience this why? This is was the legacy of the Congress party. JPC? Because so you if you cannot Adani, defend you Rahul that, Gandhi, that, but don't put it and if you cannot hostage. stop him from making this faux pas, which you is a fodder on Indian social media, then you clearly you can't Modi's blame the BJP be for it. By your entire Rahul Gandhi is and Congress's problem. He's not India's because problem. Because Mr. Adani has to be defended. It is as simple as that. You have put Indian democracy at hostage because you want to defend Adani. We that will see that in 2024. You barked up the Rafael tree. TV. You That's lost completely in 2019. You will be routed in 2024, and, and nothing policemen. will be able to save That's you. Your reality. That's Keep your Rahul Gandhi That's for another reality. day. You know, in 2014 and 2019, the BJP had a big head start over the Congress. The Congress, as you've seen over the past 30 minutes, is trying to play catch up and try and level the playing field. You think I was playing catch up? She of course, you were dominating earlier. She was screeching. So, That's not dominating. No, one That's second. Screeching. Supriya thinks she won. Amit Malviya would naturally think he won. Can we have a round of applause for both? I'm not going to ask who you think won. Uh, because both of them were gracious enough to come and join us at the conclave. You saw a fierce contestation. 
And I think some of that will play out in the build up to the next general elections. Both of you have a very onerous task ahead of you leading your social media armies. And we look forward to a very exciting contest, the kind that we saw over the past 30 minutes. Ladies I lead a social media team. He leads a fake news factory. That's the difference. Look, the eventual proof of the pudding is in eating. We are going to win this election. We are going to win the coming election. You. you can come, I lead scream, a very good screech, social media team call me names, reduce yourself to a troll. I have no problem with it. The fake news factory. The only that thing is you did this entire that. evening. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, troll. for the fireworks, can we have a round of applause, please? We had, we had a lot of uh, very... Uh, deep conversations with the Chief Justice and various other people through the morning. And now we've seen the kind of contest that we'll see on social media. Mr. Amit Malviya, Suprashinath, for joining us at the Conclave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just stay one and, second. And I think they have... I to stay something. on stage as I quickly call upon Anuj Kohli, General Manager Hitachi, to come and give a small token of our appreciation to both the leaders and uh, don't tell, uh, you know, tell us we didn't warn you. I did so right at the beginning of the session. But uh, do stay on. And we'll quickly move it to our next session. Ladies and gentlemen, do, do raise a round of applause for Ms. Renate and Mr. Malware. You're going to see a lot of the both of them in the next year to come as we run up to 2024. This, can, one, one second, can I do a selfie please? This I will never get because on social media they're like always opposed to each other. Just one second, please. This is quite unique. They would never. This is this epic, is, actually. It is. It is. <laughs> I'm also going to get if one. It, if it weren't for the India Today conclave, we'd never have both of them together. So one second, please. I Here we go. Company. Here we go. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. This is very special. Thank you. Your boxing gloves can now be taken off. Bulletproof jackets can come off as well. Thank Supriya you. Amit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so everybody take a deep breath and let's get into our next session. A little less political, more business. Crisis compass, surviving lows and lockdowns and what it takes to bounce back and thrive. This uh, next session has been brought to you by India Insurance Company, the new India Insurance Company. And to take it from here, I'm going to quickly invite our sponsor, but just give us about, uh, invite us session moderator just give us about 10 seconds to turn around our all right from politics to business uh, Crisis Compass, Surviving Lows and Lockdowns, What It Takes to Bounce Back and Thrive. Inviting our session's moderator, Mr. Raj Chengappa, Group Editorial Director, Publishing India Today Group, and our esteemed panelists, Mr. Puneet Chatwal, MD CEO, Indian Hotels Company, Ajay Bijli, MD, PVR Inox Limited, Ajay Singh, CEO, SpiceJet. Good evening, everyone. If you saw differences, India's differences in the previous session, just concluded, welcome to this session on resilience, which I promise you will not only demonstrate India's unity, but also touch your hearts and inspire you. The COVID pandemic has impacted all of us. Most of us were afflicted uh, by it. I, in fact, had an attack during the, I thought I'd got away with it in the first wave and the second wave, but it came to me on the third wave and it was Omicron at that time, very mild. I was out of it in two or three days and back to work. But I know that there were thousands who suffered, families who lost their uh, loved ones, families who their loved ones were afflicted seriously and are still recovering from the effects of COVID. And if you look at official statistics, close to 44 million people in India were afflicted with COVID during this period. Of those, uh, 530,000 people died. 
after a shaky start, which we all witnessed in the early days, and all this brings memories, not, not very good memories back, India's medical response began to kick in. And it was truly phenomenal and laudable. Not only did we develop vaccines, we manufactured them for India and for the world, and we carried out one of the world's biggest vaccine drives. Over 700 million people were, got their double vaccinations, an incredible feat by itself. But as you know, apart from the devastation that it had on our personal lives, COVID also seriously impacted our livelihoods. Overall, the Indian economy was so devastated that it went into degrowth. An economy that was growing in terms of GDP went into minus. An estimated 140 million people in India lost their jobs, and countless others. I'm, there's no figure to the number of people who experienced salary, salary cuts during that period. One study indicated that more than 45% of Indian households 